Well, good evening, good evening, and welcome, welcome to Real Talk, Real Solutions with Dr. Anana. I am so happy uh, to be here with you tonight. It's pretty, uh, just the timing, it is July 1st, 2020, right? And um, it's just amazing that how this, this episode, uh, we are focusing on motherhood in crisis. And I don't know about you, if you are anywhere in the world, you do know that we are experiencing a crisis. And I'd say inside of a crisis, uh, there is a pandemic going on all around the world. We are dealing with COVID-19, but also uh, we are dealing with such a, uh, a racial uh, crisis uh, tension that is going on all around the world. And I'm so um, just excited about the topic, just excited about the opportunity to share, to have a real conversation, but also to offer solutions. Because I don't know about you, I tell you what, as a mother, if you know me, uh, I have three amazing boys, super proud. One of my oldest sons just got married this past weekend. Um, I have, how old is my other one? I got a 17, I have a 14 year old. Um, but I have to be honest with you, dealing with COVID, um, dealing with a lot of the racial tensions and the things that's going on, these senseless killings of black men, black people, black women all around our country here in the United States. Um, it's definitely been a crisis inside of a crisis. I just want to, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I can, I can have this show. I could come on looking good and feeling good, but I have to be honest with you. Sometimes I cry almost every day honestly. So this is real talk. <laughs> this is real solutions. And I had to be very honest with you raising children right now um, and speaking to other women and mothers around the world. Um, and of course, in, in our country, I hear the stories. I, I, I'm so surprised by the challenges um, that, that we face. Um, and it's just no coincidence that even today is the kickoff of national um, awareness. And we deal with minority and mental health. Um, that we're actually kicking off. July is the month of mental health awareness in the minority community. So I think it's just really, uh, for me, it's really an honor to be here and to be able to talk about mental health. Um, I have some amazing guests here tonight, um, but just again about my story, raising men, raising black men, right now in today's society. So one thing I had to be afraid of is making sure they were wearing their masks, they're washing their hands, they're taking their vitamins, they're building up their immune system, right? And staying in, right? And now on top of that, honestly, I'm afraid of them walking out in the street and what can happen to them. Real talk, real solutions. That's what we're here to talk about tonight. Um, so I, 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 this is a, a conversation that most are not speaking about, um, <laughs> but tonight we're going to talk about it. And, and I'm super excited that I have some brave mothers that are here today. So a part of this show, even though it's a virtual show, imagine if we had a real audience, um, we would have guests. Uh, audiences and participants. And I have some incredible women that are mothers. Some are wives, uh, some are single mothers, um, but they are mothering through this crisis. And I wanted them to just share a bit about their experience um, over this past three or four months. Um, so if you will, if you can, well, I know virtually you're watching, just give a hand clap, share some hearts. Um, and I'm gonna welcome my first guest on the line. Now this amazing young lady, she is actually out of Florida and she has, uh, what does she has? Let me say uh, three of four, I don't even know the numbers. I'm not sure, but she, she's got some babies y'all. <laughs> and um, she is truly mothering during a crisis. And without further ado, Wendy, I hope I say it right, Archan. I know it's probably Creole. Archange. <laughs> Ar Archang, yes, yes, yes. Listen, how are you today? I'm well in yourself. I am well. I am well. I'm excited that you are here. If you want to just first tell us, you know, where you hail from. I know you're in South Florida, I believe. Um, and a bit about your family. First, tell us what that looks like being a mother <laughs> and a wife. Yes. 
Well, I guess, like, um, I want to thank you again for having me on. Um, my name is Wendy Arkunj. I am a wife, and um, I've been married for five years now. I have a five-year-old, a two-year-old, and a one-year-old. Uh, so, yes, I, I've been busy. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, just had my, my three babies. I was working at, I, I used to work in the hospital system, but I... I stopped doing that and I started doing the school clinics out here in Broward, uh, Broward County uh, School Board. I want to just make sure if you could just speak up a little louder, you're a little faint. Yeah, there we go. Because if you could just, okay. yeah. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, but just a little louder because I'm not sure if the audience can hear you well. Okay. Yes, um, I'm a registered nurse. I was working in the hospital system and then just recently I switched over to working with the school board. Broward County School Boards in the clinic, the school clinics. Um, and unfortunately, due to the pandemic, I am not currently working at the moment because all the schools are closed at the moment. So I've just been home with my kids for now. And yeah. <laughs> okay. So you have three yeah. young children and you, you um, due to the pandemic, you are no longer working, right? Is that right? No. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so that's the first stressor, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, and now being home with the babies, you want to, you know, again, this is really about, you know, mothering motherhood through a crisis um, and you have a little baby. So do you want to just share a bit about some of your, your own personal uh, feelings, experiences? What, <laughs> what does a typical day, a typical week look like for you as, as a young mom? Um. I'm not gonna lie. Not not every day is a is a tall day, um, you know. Not every day is rainbows, as I would as I would like it to be. Um, you know, I have I have young kids, and they want to go out. They want to go back to school and see their friends. And unfortunately, you know, at this time they can't. And so, trying to explain that to them all the time, and you know, dealing with having to now in a sense, be their teacher too, because since they're not in school, now I'm taking not only mother mothering, but also I'm, I'm their teacher too. So it's like, I'm teaching them. So sometimes it can, it can get stressful dealing with the different personalities, you know, when one doesn't get their way, it's like, you know, and they're loud at times. And so sometimes I can't even hear myself think, you know, but I just myself, I have to, I have to tell myself like, listen, it could be worse, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to God that all of them are healthy. They're here with me. They're nowhere. They're nowhere else, you know. And I'm here with them, you know. Things could be bad, but you know, I just gotta, I gotta make the best of my situation, you know. Uh, but it, it's not, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, it's definitely um, not but, easy. You know, and, and, and one thing I've learned is a learning day. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, so we, sure. we have a, a, a expert psychotherapist that'll be coming up. I'm going to be introducing her shortly, um, but she's going to be giving us some tips and um, some solutions and some advice. Um, is there any one thing that you need help with or, and again, this is about you as a mother, as a woman, <laughs> as a wife, what is one area that you know you would like to improve or, you know, is there, is there one thing that as she comes up that she can, you know, really focus on and make sure that we help um you specifically Wendy uh two things and these are things that I'm even working on currently um patience and understanding um sometimes I can forget like okay so with my kids especially the oldest one, I can forget how old she is. She's only five, but sometimes she acts like she's older than five. And so when she doesn't do something that, you know, I ask of her to do or whatever the case may be, I find myself being, you know, somewhat short-tempered and, you know, not realizing that, you know, she's still five and it's, it's me. It's not her, it's me. She's a kid. So just trying to get my patience and my understanding 
under and un, you know under controlled and yeah, I think those are the two main things that I can say that I probably need help in right now. <laughs> okay. All right. That's fair. That's good. That's good. And one thing I want to say just to you and, you know, dealing with mothers. And of course, I have the organization Moms on a Mission, um, where we really support and help be there for mothers. Is one thing do you do for yourself? Give me one thing that you do every day or you try to do at least every day to, um, you know, take care of you. Is there anything that you do? work out work out i at least i at least try to find 30 minutes okay. and you know if my if i can get all the kids down and, and they're in bed or if my husband is not doing his business thing and he's like you know what babe just go ahead and work out i do that i i take full advantage all right cool <laughs> let me go put my okay. stuff on and go work out i think that's okay. like probably the best stress reliever e ever like i get to listen to my music i get to you know, if it's doing some more personal development while I'm working out, like reading a book or catching up on things that I need to learn from my business, you know, I just, I get to do whatever it is that I want to do within those 30 minutes or even sometimes longer, you know. Okay. Good stuff. Well, yeah. I, I thank you. I know we'll get you a virtual uh, applause. Yeah, um, hopefully they you. heard you. I know it was a little low, but hopefully you guys heard it. So the one thing that she does for her me time is to work out at least 30 minutes a day. Um, she really is dedicated to doing that and just to help her keep her balance. So thank you, Wendy. If you want to stay on, you can. Um, I'm going to move right on to our next guest, okay? Thank you. All right. <laughs> So next up, I have an amazing woman that she actually, we're all in North America, but she hails out of Canada. She is a mother. Uh, she's a business owner. She also is a civil servant, if I can, if I will. I don't know if she wants to talk about that, but is civil servant good? Um, <laughs> she is a, a police officer as well. Um, she has two amazing, she has a boy. I don't know, I'm trying to think of his age, but she's a mother of a son and a daughter. Um, and we have conversations as well. And so she, she experiences a lot of challenges. <laughs> we talk about mental health, stress, anxiety, and all of the above um and i thought that it would be great for her to give her perspective on from professional you know working in a, in a professional setting as well as coming home being a mom and a lot of the sacrifices and the challenges um that she's experienced actually in quebec canada so miss manel if i can bring you to the to the screen let me see here if we can get you on all right, there she is. Welcome, welcome. How are you, Manel Kingsley? I'm great. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, inviting me. I'm so honored. <laughs> we are so, I'm happy that you were available. I know your schedule is very busy, um, but let's get right into it. We're talking about motherhood and we're talking about a crisis. And you know that we are certainly in a crisis as it comes to dealing with COVID-19, but then also dealing with the racial tension, the racial issues, um, the racism, let's just call it what it is, the killings that is happening um, all around the globe, but a sport, especially for us here in North America. So uh, listen, let's jump in if you want to tell them about your family um, and let's just talk. You know how we do is real talk resolution. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yes, uh, during the COVID, it has been very, very difficult. As you've mentioned, um, um, I'm a civil servant. I'm a police officer here up in uh, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. So I had to work. There was no ands, ifs, or buts. I um, either I continue working with the COVID and I adjust myself. But it was very difficult because I was scared myself because now, you know, I was trained to for a visible enemy now you're asking me to go to work and i'm facing an invisible enemy you know i can catch it i don't know how you know by breathing manipulating and then not only that that i get you know i could be sick but then i bring it home to my children where whom you know you're supposed to protect so this covid19 has caught me and many of us off guard you know, like literally off guard. Uh, I thought it was only going to last a couple of weeks, to be honest with you. I remember telling my daughter, don't worry, things will get better. It's just a flu. Um, and two, three weeks, we'll be back to normal. You'll see your friends. Now we're like three months down and it's still not over. And during all of that, 
I still had to go into work. I still had to show up. I had to modify the way I, I went to work. I had to, you know, bring my, you know, go in civilian clothes and then change at work, wash, you know, because I, I was scared now because now it wasn't only my life I was putting in jeopardy. It was also my family, my kids. And also now, like uh, your last guest was speaking about it, Miss uh, Madame Arcange, or uh, Wendy, um, not only that the schools were out, the daycares were out, and now I became like overnight, I became a teacher. I was already a teacher, you know, as a mom, you know, you teach values, uh, morals, and you know, your, the proper upbringing. But mm -hmm. when it came to education, you know, the one plus one and the ABCs, yeah. I just brushed it up at night. I wasn't literally sitting down and teaching my daughter, like, you know, the ABCs. And I found it very uh, tiring, very exhausting, and very challenging because, um, you know, my daughter is in, she's nine and she's in grade three. But, you know, when you're talking about fractions, I'm going way back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, I did my education. I went to university. I, you know, I did my, so, you know, I have a background and I know how to count, but you know, it's a different situation yeah. now when you have to teach them from scratch, from zero yeah. to let them understand. And then, you know, also, you know, you have the challenge of, I have a young one who's four years old and he wants to be inclusive in this teaching and education <laughs> Right, but, right. So it was very challenging. And then my my spouse, he's also a frontline worker who's a nurse. So we had to like juggle, you know, I'll work a couple of days. He'll stay home. He'll work from home when he can and if he could, because with the kids around, you know, and then, you know, the confinement. So it was very, very stressful. Very. Yeah. And then like you mentioned, uh, you know, the killing, the the George Floyd incident, that hit home, especially for me. Because I've been, you know, even though I'm a police officer, I see the atrocities that are going on. Like, I'm not blind to it. I see it. Mind you, you know, they act a certain way when they're with me. But I still see it. I hear it on the airwaves. I see it on TV. I see it when I'm on civilian clothes. But then this hit hard. It really, it was like the last drop. We're confined. We don't want to be confined. There's this invisible enemy out there, plus the visible enemy that we always known for hundreds of years, right? You know, yeah. that we're always trying to protect ourselves, whether a male or a female, yeah. you know, and it, it, it became a lot. It became very heavy, very, you know, there were times where I just didn't feel like going to work anymore. Yeah. You know, I just, I just wanted to give up, but I know that wasn't the solution. You yeah. know, it is not the solution because I have little ones that are counting on me. Yeah. I have, you know, I still have a mortgage to pay. I have, you know, bills to pay. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's not, that's not what you want to teach your kids either that in front of adversity, you give up. Yeah. That's not what you want to teach them. You want to teach them that, you know, no matter what, you know, you push and you're going to push through, you know, it may take you, you know, a minute longer, but you push through and you made it and, and it makes you a bigger person. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I mean, you, there's, there's so much to your story. You being a police officer, you seeing how police officers are abusing their power, right? You, I think you are maybe one or two, uh, black police officers in your on your department or what have you. So you experience it from a total different perspective. Then you're a mom, you're raising kids. And a part of your story, if I recall, is that you had to, there was no other option. Like either you took off or your husband took off, right? So you either, and it may be with pay or using your vacation or without, but you had to make that decision because you didn't have a daycare. So, you know, there's just so many different, perspective. So just like Wendy, she lost her job, you know, due to COVID and was then home, you know, with the kids and doing homeschooling. And then you had to make a decision on who's going to work, 
who's going to make money this week or this day, right? And you had to take off to stay home with the kids and then learn how to homeschool and teach. And I don't know about but you, but I ain't got the patience. I don't have it. I don't want it. I, God <laughs> bless every teacher out there. I love you all day long. Oh, wow. <laughs> we learn to, to really respect and value a teacher, right? So now you're into a whole nother. And I, I, I can only imagine for you because, you know, you, 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 you go to work, you're in one role, right? And then you come home, you're in another role. So what does that, and you said it was heavy. I think, did you use heaviness? Like oh, it was just, yes. the, you, yeah. It was heavy. And, you know, I know that you asked the other guests, like, what are you doing for yourself? And I'll be honest with you. It's been three months. I've, this is something that I need to work on even before the COVID. I never take time for myself. Um, I have a lot of regrets because of it. But, you know, I, I don't know. It's a balancing because I had my kids later in life. Um, so I always had this guilty conscious saying that, well, you wanted kids. You know, you need to be there. You know what I mean? And when they're big enough to take care of themselves, then you can start thinking about yourself. I don't think it's the right way to, to do things because I know that sometimes, you know, I need my time, you know, I need time for myself. But before the COVID, you know, I would have a couple of hours, you know, I'll get my hair done, my eyebrows, my nails, you know, I was always a little bit like, you know, that girly stuff. When the COVID came, forget it. Yeah. I, I had no more time for me. You know, yeah. that, that one hour every two weeks that I would go get my nails done or, you know, get my hair done, feeling beautiful. That was gone. Yeah. That was gone. And so that's when I really felt like, you know, and I had to put on a smile. You know, I even try to do my own eyebrows because, you know, I'm out in the public, you know, so I had to, you know, modify. And um, but, you know, when I thought when your last guest said, I, I really don't I don't even take a minute for myself, really. I don't like I feel. And when I do have the moment um, I'm just so exhausted. Yeah. I just fall asleep. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm, and it, it's not a good thing because it's like, I'm like the energizer, you know, like I just lie down to replug, you know, to be, and yeah. then I'm, I'm at it again. Back at it again. But, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I need to work on that. And, you know, um, I have to find a way that I can take time for myself without feeling guilty. Yes. Taking time for me. And that's my yes. big issue. And yes. of course, I have my kids that, you know, the, the manipulators, you know, like they say kids manipulate. And I feel bad because my kids somehow make me feel like, oh, mom, where are you going? Are you going with your friends and you're leaving me? I can't come with you. So I have to. That's one of my biggest uh, issue, you know. Good, good, good. That that's perfect. I'm glad you 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 pointed that out because that's one thing that's real. That guilt is real. <laughs> and I know I'm sure Dr. KBB, she's gonna touch on that that motherhood <laughs> guilt because a lot of times we feel like if you take time out for you, that you know um, you're sacrificing you know time that you could be doing with the kids or you could be dealing you know with your spouse or what have you. No, no, no. Like just like on the airplane, you gotta put that mask on yourself first. <laughs> Listen, when the plane goes down, if you're down, you can't help anyone else. So that motherhood, that that guilt, that feeling of regret. Is so so real. So I, I just want to say thank you. Um, I salute you. You know for your service as a police officer, as someone who still you know serves the community. You serve in civility. Um, so of course, when we deal with motherhood and real talk, real solutions, that's one of our four pillars. So I salute you. I thank you again for being here. I definitely want you to stay on, but I got to move on because I have one more guest. <laughs> so you just stay right there, okay, Rena? Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you awesome. For having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. All right. So moving on, moving on. Uh, um, I know talked about a lot of different things, right? Um, and of course, you know, we, 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 we I know, I know the, the doctor is here. She's on call and she's with us tonight. She is really here for real talk, real solutions. So my last special guest is someone that I want to introduce you to. So I know her personally as a colleague. Um, she is the president of our NAACP chapter here in New Jersey. She's a reverend. Um, but you know what? The one thing about it, she's a mom. 
She's an amazing mother, a single mother of three children who are now all adults, uh, all graduated, attended uh, HSBCUs, and that's historically black colleges. Um, but she's a powerful woman. Um, but you know what? Even in all of that, she is here, <laughs> but she has her own story. She has her own experiences. And as we are really kicking off um, mental health awareness, dealing with minorities, um, I, I know it's something that I'm passionate about and she as well. So I'm glad that she can be here and kick this off because she wears many hats. She's wearing a hat tonight, but she wears many, many hats. And as we talk about mental health, as we talk about motherhood and dealing in a crisis, motherhood and a crisis, because you still have to be a mom. We still have our children to support at whatever age. Um, I just wanted her to share a bit about her story, her experiences, and right now as we talk about this crisis and this pandemic that we're in today. Reverend Stewart, are you here? Hold on, hold on. I can't hear you. Let, let's see, let's see. All right, you should be good. Hello? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Just speak a little louder, but I think we're good. All right, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay. How are you this evening? All right, I'm good, thank you. Awesome, awesome. So if you want to just share a bit, um, you being a mom, yes. a single mother, Yes. Um, how old are your children now? 30, 25, one will be 26 next week, and 22. 2002 is that's the baby that's the baby and that's her son so the other two are our daughters right and you raised them all by your lonesome if i'm not right right, right. so you know i clap for you all day for that one <laughs> and congratulations because the baby just graduated from morehouse is that right yes he did yes he yeah, did. yeah 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 <laughs> so in in that excitement where you are you should be full of joy Right. Happy, you know, yeah. as having a recent graduate. But let's say real talk. There's some struggles. Yeah. You're, you're going through a crisis. Right. Um, and I know even for you as a mother, you know, you even lost your mom. I mean, so and this is not to, um, you know, it's heavy and I know it. And, I, I, you know, as long as you're good with it. But I just want people to understand that there's so much going on in our lives. There's so much that we deal with, right? But yeah. we still got to go to work every day. We still got to be a mother. We still, you know, you still are a reverend. You have a, a church that you support. You are the, the leader of our NAACP chapter, but you still are a mother. Yeah. You still are a woman, right? That have all that you, you still are dealing with all of these things. And, and that's what tonight is about. This is real. This yeah. is real talk. It's real life, Very right? Real. And 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 we cannot. I think a lot of times we just keep moving. You know what I mean? We just keep going. We just keep putting a smile on our face. But you know what? We, we, we're dealing with some stuff. And I feel like tonight is that opportunity. It gives us that platform that we can be real. We can talk about what's going on. And then preferably, I know Dr. Kathy Barton Brown is amazing. She's going to give us some solutions, some tips. And again, it's not even about us. But it's about those that are watching. So even those that are watching, make sure that you like, you comment, and you share because you just don't know what part of any of these stories that can bless somebody, but more importantly, may even save a life Amen. tonight. And I believe it. I feel it that we, we've got to do more and we have to be open and real. So Reverend, you go right ahead. Whatever you want to share, whatever you want to talk about this. We're talking about motherhood in a crisis. Go right ahead. Okay. Well, thank you for having me on. But yes, um... The last few months have been very difficult, and I'm a crybaby. Um, I am a mother, single mom, three adult children, again, all college graduates, two of the girls are homeowners. But on March 15th, world came crashing down to an emotional, spiritual, and mental battle that caused me to stop living in New Jersey and leave to go to Atlanta, Georgia, to be with my family. Um, and then in the midst of the pandemic, um, my son came home for his spring break for one week and is here in New Jersey. And then I had to leave to go to Georgia a week later to take care of my family emergency in Atlanta, leaving my a new apartment, my job here, my church here, not knowing what was going to happen, how long I was going to be gone. In the midst of all that, there's some, you know, specific things that just, I could not wrap my head around, but I had to keep my faith and people kept saying, take one day at a time. And I couldn't do that. I could only take one hour at a time because I couldn't handle one day at a time. 
Mm-hmm. And in the midst of that, my 22 year old son is at home by himself in New Jersey, where I have two daughters, one that I'm taking care of and one that is working because she's an essential employee, making sure she's taking care of herself in the pandemic, but still worrying about my young black son who's home in New Jersey with all of these things going on. Leaving work, not knowing if I was going to have a job, when and if I came back, because my first focus is my child, because I worry about them more as adults than I did as children. And then they were children because they did what you said, do go where you said, go and you can console their friends. When they become adults, you can't do any of that. Yes. And with that being said, the enemy has a way of creeping in and did just that. And so I will have to say that it's probably been the most difficult three months of my life. Mm. I've probably cried more than I normally cry, and I cry a lot. And the first month, I didn't care about a Zoom call from the church, from the NAACP, from around the world. From It didn't matter. My family was my first ministry, and that's what I attended to. Yeah. And now, you know, two months after that, which, again, after the three months, it's like, you know, I have a church I have to pastor. I have people I have to pastor. I have people that elected me to, you know, to lead and to guide and to just kind of push. Um, I'm really not sure all of what I want to share, but I will say this, listening to, I've listened to two of the previous guests is um, I've been that single mother with little children Mm -hmm. and not having anybody to help. But with adult children, it's even more difficult because People think because you're an adult, because you've got a house, and my girls are homeowners, Mm -hmm. that you have a house, that you don't have to worry. But those are when some things come. And I'm not a homeowner. I've never had a home. So Mm -hmm. here I am trying to figure out, God, how am I going to handle taking care of two households with no income? Mm -hmm. God, how am I going to make sure that my son is okay? Because this is the celebration of his life finishing school the last semester historically back college and doing what you're doing and he has his own physical ailments Mm -hmm. okay how do i help him and support him as a male who is passive like it is what it is you know whether we have a ceremony or not whatever i got my degree Mm -hmm. and making sure that he is okay while i'm away because he's not a talker and then having one that is going to talk and is going to say so i have to separate myself with three different adults who need three different things. And you ask them, what um, do they do for self-care? And I've been asked that a lot lately. So I'm believing that God wants me to check on that. I don't know because for me, my self-care is I don't do hair. I don't do nails and massages and all that. My self-care is a shower and sleep. Mm. And I thank God that he allows me to sleep throughout most of the nights. But that's the only self-care. I don't really know what self-care looks like because, Mm -hmm. I hate when people say I sacrifice for my kids because you had those children. So when you provide the basic necessities for them to me, that's not a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. That's what you signed up to do when you said yes. However you said yes to those children, you said yes. So I don't believe it's a sacrifice, um, but I believe that when, when they become adults, it's a different type of thing. And then even just listening to the previous two speakers, um, having a church having a job and being the president of the NAACP, those are three other children. Not that they're babies, but they're grown. Yes, absolutely. The church is grown. The church is yeah. older than me. The NAACP is older than me. My job is older than me. So right, that's right, still right. three things, three children, three things that I need to be responsible for. So not that I put my feelings behind, but I put it to the side a little bit to do what I need to get done. And I don't even know how I do it, but I do know that God guides every step and I listen to God and I know that's how I've made it through and Mm -hmm. how God has sent people to bless me along the way because remember two households and no income but yet none of us are living on the street none of us has lost any weight and it has put some stresses but in all in all all that is it's made me reevaluate when people talk about mental health and mental illness Mm -hmm. especially in the black community and then even more so in the community of faith because you can and you should have people that you can talk to um, about whatever it is that you're feeling and not feeling guilty about it. So it's a lot. Um, I haven't even been able to decipher it, but I do know that God is taking me through and he's taking my family through. So my three adult biological children and my three surrogate children, the NAACP, (laughs) Centennial Amy Zion Church in Closter, and my job at Edison. So I know that however it's balancing, it is. 
Yeah. And I will take my Wusa moments, but they're not like other people oh, think I should take them because I've never been that type of person. Um, I've always been a kind of a casual coaster in that regard when it comes to me. So hopefully that will help somebody. But I know that um 54 years old and I've made it and I'm making it, but I know it's because of whatever plans that God has for me and he ordering my steps, God ordering my steps. And, you know, the village, the village always makes a difference. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it's so much, <laughs> yes. you know, so, so much to, um, you know, to that, to, to our story, to our, our being a woman, a mother. Um, and, and I'm like, you, you know, people don't see it, you know, most of the times it is a smile. And that's what I shared in the beginning. I can say, you know, throughout this crisis, there's, there was a, almost like every day I was crying. Yeah. You know, I mean, now you, you, we can get do through, we can get through, right? But I have to be honest, like, we have to say that there's a level of sadness, yeah. there's a level of grief, there's a level of uncertainty, right? That that goes along with just being in this crisis, but then also being a mother through it, you know. And we got to put on that face, and we have to support them, right? Um, and and it's just real, and that's why I was just so happy just even blessed to have this opportunity to be honest to have a real conversation and i thank you um so much for doing that um you know because you know people see like they said they see our glory but they have no idea, have no you idea. Know, <laughs> what the story is and and i'm just very intentional on even sharing the story you know what because i really believe we don't go through it just for ourselves no. like you know what i mean like god brings us through when he brings us out the test is for the testimony you know what and we have to be tested we we say it you know you know we talk about faith right we talk about you know the, the, this but it is it's a walk it's an yeah. every day and, and i like how you said you know what you take it day by day hour by hour, hour by right hour. you know you don't have all the answers you know but but we do get through it so any anything else that you want to share um before we move on I want to say this, that um, for me, the pandemic and all of its chaos was and still is not a pause, but God wanting us to stop. Because a pause means you're ready to move again. You know, when, the, when you get to that light and you know it's red, but you know what's coming, it's going to be green and you're <laughs> anticipating going. I believe that this pandemic worldwide was God saying stop. Just for a moment, just just stop because you don't know if the light is going to turn green. Just stop. Stop and see me. Stop and hear me. Stop and feel me. And nice. I believe when we get to that place where we really stop and not keep, not continuously pausing like one, two, three, green light and you keep running. No. When you keep running and it's not your time, you run out. And I just believe that the pandemic really is a, a stop and we need to just just stop for a minute and you know you know you know watching bad boys one and two is woosa woosa we did we do need to take a woosa and understand whoever it is that we believe serve worship what have you is just take a moment to realize that all of this is bigger than we are but we're in it and the thing about it is while we're in it we don't worry about going through it just while you're in it see what god wants you to see while you're in it and hopefully when you get to the other side, whatever the other side is for you, you'll say, wow, I made it through this too. Because in all of that, I haven't even been able to truly grieve my mother dying. My mother died a year ago on Juneteenth. Okay. So you don't have time to, to grieve the way others might because you still have to breathe. You still have to exhale. And when we wear these masks that we're required to wear, what I realized I was losing breath because I was just breathing in my mouth, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, but when I learned to in my, breathe in and in, inhale in my nose and exhale out my mouth, guess what? I no longer feel suffocated. So if we really take the time to think about our breathing and inhale what's going on and exhale, what we need will be in and what we don't will come out and it'll come out in the sense of a cough. So sometimes we just need to stop. Yeah. And sometimes self-care just means stop. You don't have to go anywhere and do anything and get anything done. Just stop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lock yourself in the bathroom, lock yourself in the car, you know, hide in the closet for a minute, but just stop. And I believe that that will help us it's you know get through and it doesn't have to even be a physical hide but just a real in out and 
just enjoy, you know, enjoy the lesson because if not, it'll take us places that we don't really need to be. And I trust God completely with everything, no matter what it looks like, no matter how I feel, I still trust God. Amen. 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 Well, we thank the good, right, Reverend. <laughs> I knew she was going to bring us on in <laughs> as we transition this segment. But again, I thank you, Reverend Stewart, for sharing. I thank you for your leadership being an example uh, to many uh, women, mothers. Um, I, 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 I certainly um, respect and I honor you. And I thank you for being available tonight. Um, and I know you'll be back. We're going to definitely, uh, you know, have you back to share. You'll just be like a feature speaker. But tonight, I just wanted you to come and share uh, a thank bit you, about what we're talking about motherhood and crisis, because I know it is definitely real. So thank you so much. Um, you. And all right. So I'm going to move right on, move right on. So listen, guys, I hope you're here. You are in enjoying um, some of the real talk <laughs> that we're having with these amazing women um, from, you know, different walks, different experiences, but just getting some of their stories and some of their perspectives. So thank you for hanging in there again. Feel free um, to, to share, uh, to like, to comment, any takeaways, any nuggets um, that you have. And it's so funny because I think in May we were featuring mothers and I think it was Dr. Um, Natasha, she was talking about just breathe. And we did that just as an exercise. We took uh, like 60 seconds, Dr. Kathy, we, and we just breathe because we don't even realize that we barely breathing. <laughs> we, we, we are barely breathing. And just to be cognizant and mindful of taking a deep breath, and I'm sure, and I'm not the expert, I'm not the professional, but I do have one tonight. So without further ado, we're going to move right in. And, and again, I want you to know that July is National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month, right? And the truth is that there are many disparities when it comes to mental health, um, to us as uh, minorities, to seeking out mental health and services. Um, and, and, and I believe it's like one out of five people are experiencing or will experience a mental health challenge. So it's not a rarity. It's not something that, you know, uh, is, you know, shunned or something that we shouldn't talk about. It really is real. And the reality is a lot of uh, things, especially in the minority community, we look to the church. But the church is not open. <laughs> we look right. And, and, and that's not an option. Um, so I really want us to think about mental health and seeking out um, experts um, and getting help and, and mental health services, if you will, seriously. I know myself, real talk, Dr. A, I'm getting some therapy, y'all. <laughs> I'm going to just tell you, I really am. I'm learning to, to do, um, I don't even know what the name of them are, but I, I have to commit to doing self-mindfulness uh, and, and getting in certain environments every single day um, because you, you just have to. It's just real. So even just, if you know, being open and being transparent about my level of sadness and things that I was experiencing, um, if that helps and blesses anyone, then I'm good with that. <laughs> but I, I'm in therapy. Listen, I'm getting my virtual therapy. I'm having my phone calls every week, right, to deal with motherhood crisis and so much more that goes on with dealing with this pandemic. But I have an amazing expert. I have an amazing woman of God, a fearless woman leader, Dr. Kathy Barton Brown. She is MSW, LMSW, ACSW, and PhD. So we, I went and got one of the best of the best. <laughs> she is a licensed psychotherapist who has been in the mental health field for over 35 years. All right, guys. She attended the University of Michigan. Um, she has worked in this field, uh, been working in this field now. And it's just incredible because when I say, you know, she has her own talk show, she goes live. But here's the thing about her. She is a mother. She is a mother. I love how she has three amazing daughters, how she uh, like infuses her daughters. Um, it's one that I know really well. That's awesome artist, Karina. But she infuses her children and her motherhood even into her practices and her services. Right. And so she's been in private practice for the past 14 years. Um, her model is inspiring people to help themselves. 
to help themselves, not to be dependent on anyone, but to be able to get to the point where you can help yourself. And once a month, she's a regular guest on the WFLT. It's an African-American inspiration where she encourages African the African-American community. Um, and it's just awesome that, you know, she wants them to be aware of their emotional and mental health, and she teaches on mental health diagnosis. So I'm so really excited because she was available, and I'm just so blessed us to have amazing women, amazing leaders that they just happen to say yes to me, <laughs> just yes to my blessed girl. And, and they're here tonight to share with you all. So again, I want you to share this broadcast right now, right? As I bring Dr. Kathy Barton Brown to the stage, to the broadcast. Good evening, Dr. Kathy KB. <laughs> oh my goodness. Good evening, Dr. Anana. I've just been sitting back, taking in the nuggets and the testimonies and and I'm just blessed already. I Amen. just feel so blessed just listening to, to your guests and them sharing from their heart. Yeah. Um, we have an incredible task as mothers. Mm. It's, it's a lot. Some of us have plates. Some of us have saucers, but some of us have platters with sideboards. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> yes. We need several trays to handle the balancing act that we have to carry on, especially yeah. if we work and we have businesses and we they have the children, and then we have the home, and we may have the husband, and and so we have a lot that we have to deal with, yeah. you know. And I love the title of your show. Real, real, yeah. real talk, real solutions. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And I, I'm happy because I know you for all that. <laughs> I know you about that, okay? And and I know that you know you you even just shared, and I, I remember one of your lives with your daughter, and how mm -hmm. you even experienced, and I'm sure even throughout down through the years, but even currently you've experienced some of the racial tension, right? Okay. And some up some things, you know, and even for yourself and with your children, right? So I know it's even real for you. So you you experience it. You are an expert. You are in private practice every single day. Um, I I didn't even know if you were back to to business, but you are serving right now. Um, I had to come back. Clients. Too many people needed help. I had to come back. Yeah. You know? yeah. Thank um, you for that. Thank you. Thank you for that. But again, you still are a mother. You still are mothering. You still are raising your children, right? And you still are being that for them. Um, yeah. and, and how do you do that even for yourself? So wherever you want to start, listen, you go right ahead. I, I'm ready. I got my pen. I'm on my couch. If you want to get me some therapy tonight, I'm good with it. <laughs> I, I, well, I'm ready. I'm yours. You know, I wasn't really sure how we were going to go about, but I do have about eight tips that I want to share. But I want to go back to uh, Pastor Stewart. Yes. And when Pastor Stewart was talking about breathing, that actually is the therapeutic way to breathe. There are so many times I hug all of my patients before they leave, which has been difficult with the COVID-19 crisis because we're not supposed to touch. Yeah. Yeah. So some of my people wouldn't even come in or wouldn't do the virtual because they're so used to the hug. We need those hugs and that contact. Mm -hmm. But when I hug people sometimes, they're not breathing. And I'll say to them, I need you to breathe. Mm -hmm. And they'll take a shallow breath. And I'll say again, I need you to breathe. Mm -hmm. And they'll take a slightly deeper breath. And I'll say, okay, we're going to do one more for the Holy Spirit. One for the Father, one for the Son. Now we're going to do one for the Holy Spirit. On. I need you to really breathe. Take in a deep breath. And then I want you to slowly release it. If you are experiencing any type of anxiety, if you are experiencing any type of, of panic or feeling overwhelmed, that is the secret to slowing everything down is to breathe. Yeah. Breathe through your nose, slowly out through your mouth, and it slows your heart rate down. Mm -hmm. So if you get in a situation, even an interview, just take a second to breathe. But on this journey called motherhood, we don't have written permission anywhere to breathe. Mm -hmm. And nor do we have verbal permission to breathe. So it's something as simple as breathing is self-care for some people because they have no other time for themselves in between. So I'm going to talk about self-care in just a minute, but I want to just kind of run through. So number one, we must first acknowledge that there is a crisis. So many times in, in, the, in the African-American community, we have been taught to walk in denial. We have been taught to bury our head under, under the sand. We have been taught to not deal with the things that are going on 
or we're so used to trauma, drama, and everybody's chaos that we just keep on like there's nothing really happening. Even here in Flint with the water crisis, we have so many people who have suffered from the water crisis and have been so used to suffering trauma in their life that the water crisis didn't seem to affect them at all, or they haven't even acknowledged that they're hurting from the water crisis, that their lives were uprooted because of the water crisis, that that Aunt Minnie died because of um, of having Legionnaire's disease being in the hospital from the water crisis. We are so used to the trauma and the drama of life. Some of us grow up with being hurt. What goes on in this house stays in this house. So therefore, we don't get permission to talk to other people when we're hurting so bad. We're also taught, don't talk to strangers. The strangers will hurt you. It's not the strangers that's hurting us. It is the people that we know. It's Uncle Lester the molester that's hurting us. And we have been taught to keep the family secrets quiet. So when do we get a chance to talk about the deep-seated issues in our heart, the things that hurt us? So when you're going for a therapist, let me just throw this in. Don't go to anyone. Because you have to be comfortable enough to share a heart secret. So let's say shoe shop. I know you like shoes, Dr. A. I, do I can't even wear them no more like I used to, but I still like to buy them. So when you go shoe shopping, you're not going to get a shoe that's popping on your foot because it's not going to give the best appearance. You're not going to get a shoe that's tight on your foot because then it may rub, irritate, and by the night you'll be ready to crawl rather than walk. But finding a therapist is kind of the same way. If you go to a therapist and they're just saying things that don't line up with your value system, you're not going to share your heart secrets with them. You're not going to tell them about the things that hurt you as a child. You're not going to tell them about being mistreated. You're not going to tell them about racism. So you move on to the next therapist. So we must first acknowledge that we're in a crisis. And then once we acknowledge that we're in a crisis, and particularly with our children, we have to find ways to connect. Number two, empower our children. So how do you empower children in a racist society? You let them know who they are. You must tell them who they are. When we come here, we're born an empty slate. If we don't tell our children and empower them with who they are, who does the Brown family stand for? What does the Collins family stand for? Who do we represent? What, what is it about this family that is unique and special? All of us are so special, there's no one else on earth like us. There's no one else on earth who has our fingerprint. There's no one else on earth who has our exact DNA because that's just how special we are. I can remember when I was growing up and, and I didn't even know, but I lived in the projects. You know why I didn't know I lived in the projects? because my mother never put that label on us. We didn't know we lived in the projects. We thought we lived in a brand new apartment complex because it was brand new, the grass was beautiful, and it was just apartments. It wasn't until later I found out that I lived in the projects. But living in the projects and having project mentality are two different things. So my mother, in her God-given wisdom, didn't put a label on us. She told me that I was I was beautiful, I was smart, I could do anything I wanted to do. She took me down to the red light district. Now, this is old school wisdom, to the red light district. And she said, you see that woman right there? She's a prostitute. And I said, I was 12. I said, yeah, mom, I kind of, I, I, I thought so. She said, let me tell you something. Whatever you decide to be in this life, I expect you to be the very best of whatever you decide to be. So, of course, I'm thinking 12 years old, but what does that have to do with a prostitute? And she said, if you decide that you want to be a prostitute, and of course, I guess, my, I would never, she said, let me finish. If you decide that you want to be a prostitute, I better not catch you on a corner. You better decide to be a high class call girl with a penthouse apartment and very classy and well taken care of with no one knowing your business. So we we don't think of our, of our children being in that field. But the point was, be the best that you can be. Whatever you put your hand to, be the very best that you can be. So we must train up our children in the way that they should go, as the Bible says. So when we're training them up, that's like, to me, a military term. 
when you go and you watch um, a boot camp, what you see is over and over and over again, they drill into the group recruits on how to do what they're being trained to do till it becomes not their second nature, their first nature, how to load the gun. They can do it out of a sound sleep because they're being trained. And that's exactly what we must do with our children. We must train them so consistently that it's automatic nature for them to be polite, for them to have manners, for them to be confident, for them to stand and hold their head up. Because in this critical hour, only what they know about themselves will keep them from falling in the cracks. Only what they know about themselves will keep them from falling in the cracks. Oh man, wait, wait. Do- this is Dr. KVB. This, this is so good. Wait, wait. <laughs> this, you know what? This is so powerful because I, I think that is so key. Like what they know about themselves, not what the world is going to tell them, not what the history book, I mean, you know, because we know the history is definitely not talking about our history, but it's so important for us to speak and tell our children who they are. That, that, me that right there. When I was in kindergarten, I was five years old. My babysitter's husband told me that somebody bit me in my face and gave me holes in my face. I stopped smiling at five years old because I became conscious about my face and holes. I went to kindergarten and looked around the room and there was no other kids that had holes in their face, dimples. Right, right. right, And I stopped smiling, but my mom was tuned in. And so kids can be overwhelming. It can be chaotic. We can have so much going on, but we must still be connected. We have to still stay very intimate, very connected. My mother told me about a spouse, study them like a book. Know every chapter, every sentence, and with your children even more. Because she knew me, she saw my continence change. Mm. And she pulled me inside and sat me on her lap and she said, what is wrong? What's wrong? And I, I, I started crying and I, I said, Mr. Cap said I have holes in my face. The other kids don't have holes in their face. And, 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 and she kissed me on this one and she kissed me on that one. Wow. And she said, baby, you don't have holes in your face from somebody biting you. She said, they're called dimples. And it's because an angel kissed you on both cheeks. My goodness. It changed the whole, I never stopped smiling. And God is so strategic. When I got in the first grade, my teacher was Mrs. Walker. Mrs. Walker had holes deeper than mine in her face. And she looked at me because she caught me in one of those moments when I flashed back to kindergarten. She looked at me and she said, you look so much better when you smile. Wow. I've been smiling ever since. Listen, that that is so powerful and i hope everybody is getting that because even with blessed girls the one thing we deal with is your own identity yeah. knowing who you are and how many times we are walking around even when we see our millennials and younger mm-hmm. then, you know and they're not doing what we think they should be doing and the pants is sagging it because they just don't know who they are and then they, they don't took know. on what somebody else said about them or they took on what some you know another identity or mm-hmm. and now they're walking around in that but that's just because no one really told them exactly who they were. They didn't embrace that. That is so powerful. So you, are you guys getting that? Are you? I just want to make sure. So let me make sure. So I got one is acknowledge there is a crisis. Two is right. to empower our children. Let them know That's who right. they are. I got to make sure they're getting let it, Dr. Know. KB. I got to make right. sure they're getting it. So go ahead. We write. We write on them who they are. Yes, yes. And, and even when we're overwhelmed, I, I heard Wendy say that sometimes she gets overwhelmed and so she gets a little impatient. We have to sometimes change the focus. Yeah. And we have to just say, remind ourselves, because it's easy to forget. These are my blessings mm-hmm. that God trusted me to put in my hand yes. and actually have a hand in raising, nurturing, and shaping who they are. Yeah. And even when we're overwhelmed, we have to remember to enjoy the experience mm-hmm. of having That's children. Awesome. Enjoy them. They're funny. They can be <laughs> so funny. And when we when we when we stop. And we breathe, right, Pastor Stewart? We stop and we breathe. Then we can say, you know what? This child is funny. I'm not going to let it exhaust me. I'm going to laugh because the joy of the Lord gives us strength. Amen. That, that laughter and a merry heart is good like medicine. I'm going to take my medicine today, and I'm just going to laugh at these children. 
Because it don't matter if they got toys thrown all over. We can just clean that up by the end of the day. We don't have to stress out. We can choose our stressors. We can choose what we're going to allow to to overwhelm us or to, to get in. That stuff don't have to be in. Choose our stressors. Choose That's our good. stressors. Mm. I'm not going to stress over toys that we can pick up at any time. Yeah. I'm over a prayer mark on when there's all kind of hacks on internet to how to get it off. Yeah. So we don't have to put stress there. Yeah. Just learn to the, enjoy it. My my dad was a batterer. My dad was such a batterer. He bought my mom a brand new car, marked the tires with chalk so he would know whether she moved the car. And he would come home and he would take grip bottles, throw them against the wall and break them. And the glass would fall in my crib on my face. And my mom would pray and pick the glass off. And when, you know, the most dangerous time for a woman is when she tries to leave a batterer. My dad put a sawed off shotgun on my mother's nose, cocked for eight hours, said, I'm gonna blow your head off. We were rescued by the police. When I was 18 months old, my brother was two and a half. My mother had a nervous breakdown for six months, didn't even know who we were. But she came back with a vengeance because that's what mothers do. Mothers don't lay down and quit. Mothers keep on fighting as long as it's breath in their body. They're going to keep on fighting. They will take the face off a bear for their children. Yeah. And so because of her commitment to us, yeah. she came all the way back. And it took her eight years to get a two-year degree, but she did it. And during that eight years, she made it fun. Monday through Friday, she studied. We had routines. We had work. But on Saturday morning, she get up and she said, if you clean your room in 30 minutes, I have a surprise for you. Almost every Saturday. Yes. We would be over in Canada, Wendy. We would go across the bridge, be in Canada, having lunch in a park, in a park right over on the other side, pick the rocks, bring it illegally back in the States. But we would have some kind of adventure yes. because she refused to quit. She refused to be overburdened. But she always took the opportunity to empower us. Let me say this, particularly with women who are mothers of African-American young men. I believe God hand selects you all. I have a slight little envy. I'm not an envious person, but I wanted a boy. But God allowed me to have, I have two girls and I don't give me no more. You want to have a third one. <laughs> but God allowed me to have girls. But if you have a young man that you're raising, and he has a more gentle, compassionate spirit. Allow him to be gentle. Allow him to be compassionate because the earth need African-American men who can feel, who can feel. Just because he's tenderhearted, he's compassionate, doesn't mean he's a punk. Because a lot of times in our community, he's soft. He's, no, 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 no. He's compassionate. He may be the one that's the teacher that's going to reach the little boys that would be in the gang, who would be murdered in the gang. He may be the only person that can reach them. So when we have our young African-American boys, they don't have to be tough and macho and ready to fight. Their path may be different. And we have to allow them to walk in how God created them. You know, the Bible talks about fathers, don't provoke your children. Don't push them so hard that they become angry. They become angry. And when, when they feel pushed and they have no voice, they get angry and they rebel. Hear them when they speak. So acknowledge the crisis, empower our children. Number three, redirect the fear. Because right now there's so much fear. There, there's, there's fear of the police. There's fear of the virus. There, there's all kind of fear that's going on. And there's, there's so many things that could have us paralyzed, literally mentally paralyzed us to the point that we become afraid to go out. We become paranoid. You know, we be proactive. But I say introduce your fear to faith. I trust God to keep me. That's the bottom line. I trust God to keep me. I pray for a covering over my children. I pray for a covering over myself, over my household. My seed is blessed. Everywhere I step is blessed. Everywhere I go, COVID shall stay obey. He will not come nigh my dwelling. Everywhere I step, I'm protected because God is guiding my steps. And so we have to take our fear, reduce it to faith so faith can beat it down. If we walk in fear, we'll never have the power of God. We won't have the true victorious power of God because we'll be under fear instead of over fear. 
Very okay. Good. All right. You got to stop right there. All right, oh. Dr. KBB. Hold on. Wait, wait, because that's good. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'll be having some fear. Yeah. <laughs> and that's real you, Come and on. That's, that's, that's real. Because I'm that's like, real. you, that's you, what, you fear fear enough, I got to worry fear. about you. Wearing a mask, I got to no. worry about you washing hands, who you've been around, who they've been around, right? Then on top of that, I got to be worried about somebody with some racial issues and who's going to, you getting pulled over. Like, so that's, that fear is real. So I like that you say, like, yeah. let's, let's address it, right? Let's address but it. I'm not going to have the fear over top of me. I'm going to have faith over top of me. Because then what happens is when fear begins, if, you, if fear comes in, now we all have something where I hate spiders. Okay. But I feel the spider in the heartbeat. See, I'll dominate it. Because I hate you, I'll dominate it. Okay? So so fear is out here. And you see, I didn't say don't have no fear. Yeah. I said, introduce your fear to your faith. Because fear is a natural factor we're going to deal with. But what we don't allow is the spirit of fear to come over us and torment us. Because fear will come and present itself. And if we embrace it and take it in, It'll start driving all our thoughts, all our actions, and all our behaviors and decisions. But when we put faith in place, it becomes a shield. And we keep it from becoming a spirit of fear tormenting us. A spirit of fear will keep you up all night. Right. You you, you know your son's got to go out tomorrow. You know your daughter's got to go here and there. Faith says, Father, I trust you to keep my children. Father, I trust you to keep them protected from the top of their head to the sole of their feet. Father, I thank you for even protecting from their own silly decisions. From their own silly, silly, you you just keep them covered because that's our position. Amen. As the mother, you know, when kids are little, you can tell them what to do and all that other pretty little stuff, like she said. But when they get older, see, when they're little, we carry them in our arms. When they become adults and make their own decisions, we carry them in our hearts. It's easy to carry them in our arms, but carrying them in our hearts, see, that heart don't stop thinking about them. In their, Oh, that's good. That's good. And that's what Dr. 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 Reverend, I said, I'm calling her doctor. That's what Reverend Stewart was saying, that it's yeah. different, right? Because like you yeah. said, when they're young, you're going here, who you're going to be that's around, right. you drop them right. off, you pick them up. But as they get into adulthood, they go away to college, they're working. You're, it's a whole nother level <laughs> of fear and stresses, who they relationship are with, who they're going with, who they're driving with. That's a whole nother level of fear. That's and so, so You know true. what? This is what I do, Dr. A. I take out the word fear out of my di- out of my dialogue. You know what I say? Mm. It's a concern. It's a what? It's a concern. Okay. I'm concerned about that. That okay. concerns me because in the Bible, it speaks about the spirit of fear, but it doesn't say concern. So it's natural for us as mothers to be concerned. So I'm concerned about COVID, but yeah. I will not let COVID put me in a place of being tormented. Because that's what fear, the spirit of fear just torments. And I would not be tormented. I have lost so many friends to COVID. I've lost classmates to COVID. I've lost dear choir members to COVID. You know, but I refuse to let COVID come and say, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. (laughs) I'm going to get you. No, you're not. Amen. I'm going to be wise and walk in wisdom. I was scheduled to go out of town. And the person I was going out of town with said, uh, I said, well, I'm going to postpone the trip. I'm not walking in fear. I said, no, I'm not either. I'm walking in wisdom. Wisdom <laughs> right, right. says, cancel the trip. Yeah, it was yeah, to yeah. Vegas. Yeah, wisdom yeah. says, that's too many people from all over the world. Yeah. So I, I, so as time went on, everything was shut down by the time we were supposed to go. Yeah. So we do. We, we exercise wisdom. We exercise faith, yeah. you know, and we trust God above all. That's and good. so one thing I think COVID has done for me is, is the rubber hit the road. It wasn't just no longer talking faith. It was putting it in action. For sure. Especially when I began to see people dying like this. You know, people, good friends, you know, mother has a mother cough in their face on Friday, on Monday, they are full-blown COVID. Mm-hmm. You know, we had so many people on respirators. We just lost track of how many people were dying. You know, the funeral director had, had literally 10 times as many bodies as he normally would have. Yeah. You know, they had to rent trucks to put the bodies in because there was no more room, you know, so that's a reality. So when yeah. you have a reality like that, it's very easy to say, <laughs> but when you get like this, you have no defense and we can't afford to not have defense and our defense is in the word of God and prayer. 
and we trust it with our whole heart. Amen. Mm -hmm. So you get that on back over there because it ain't coming nigh. My address is 1002. It's not coming nigh 1002. And I'll step on the Holy Ghost rifle and blow you straight across the street to somewhere else. Because we're going to take this to war. Come on. That's what mothers do. Yes. We war. We don't lay back and be passive. We war. Okay, so number four, master our emotions. Mm. Because when we're in a crisis, it's very easy to react. In a crisis, mothers have to respond. We have to respond. And and I had my, my oldest daughter said to me, she said, why don't you ever get upset with me? Why don't you ever argue with me? And I looked at her and I said, sweetheart, I'm trained to deal with killers. I'm trained to talk men into putting their guns down. I'm trained to talking people off the bridge so they don't kill themselves. Why would I let you push your button? You don't rank in being able to control my emotions. Don't allow anyone to live in your head rent free. You need all of your emotion ability to deal with your children, your household, your job, that plate of platter that you carry. So there is no room to let the emotions get out of control. So when people try to push your buttons, don't give them that much power over you. If you feel yourself rising up, remove yourself from their presence. Don't even let them know that they can get to you on that level. Because in the time of crisis, everybody's looking to the mother. Everybody's looking to the mother to, to make this ship upright, to balance this thing out. Because it's very easy for it to go upside down without the mother in control. So we can't let the men push our buttons. We can't let the children know that they can push our buttons, even if we're upset with them. And the one thing we have to always be conscious of when it comes to our children, they are human beings. So no matter what we put in them, they still at some point are going to make their own decisions sometime before they get grown. They're going to try. They're going to get with their friends. And if they're in the wrong route and the friends are influencing them, or maybe it's just their own little this mischievous nature and they want to do something will be challenged and so when we're challenged with even the things that they have done we can't allow ourselves to be emotionally out of control i remember um i remember hearing uh some people in class talk about well they would discipline their kids when they were angry no see we, in the african-american community you did something you got your butt beat right on the spot and a lot of times our parents were angry but we must learn to take our emotions and push the pause button because when we just whip our children with no explanation and all they see is we're angry and we're smacking them, they have no understanding. They have no understanding, but everything in life for me and what I've tried to do with mine is a teachable moment. I don't, I don't harp on, and I'm gonna go into number five, master our emotions and I'm gonna tie it straight to number five, love unconditionally especially with our children love unconditionally because they're going to do things you're not going to like they're going to grow up and make decisions that you're not going to agree with i remember my oldest came downstairs and, and she was upset with her dad and she decided she was leaving the home and she came downstairs and she looked like santa claus because she had these two black garbage bags over her back now why she didn't use a suitcase i don't know it's plenty in the house but she got timmy and she said i'm leaving and she was adult and I said, okay. And I took my ring off. And I said, you see this ring? I said, I want you to understand one thing about me and one thing about life. Just like this ring is a circle and it's unbroken, my love for you is unbroken. And as your mother, there is nothing you or anyone else could ever do to break my love for you. My love for you is unconditional. And she went out the door. And if I tell you my heart was broken in that moment, it felt like somebody had stabbed me with 10 knives all straight in the heart. But the one thing I knew is I had always been praying for God to guide her, direct her, and protect her. And because I knew I prayed that from a sincere heart, I trusted God to keep her. So she called me about two weeks later and she says, Mom, can, can you get me some gas? And I said, meet me at the gas station. She met me at the gas station. I filled her car up and she said, I'm so hungry. And I said, well, you want to get snacks here at the gas station or do you want to sit down with your sister and I? And she said, well, can I sit down? I said, sure. 
I set her down and I let her eat whatever she wanted to order. She was back home in two weeks. Back home saying, I'm never leaving again. But that is an example of unconditional love. She knows, and she said to me a few weeks ago, you've always said there's nothing I can do to break your love. Now, that don't mean they don't try because Lord knows they would definitely try. But the one thing we have to do is stay in position. Lord, you gave me this child and I have poured into this child. When children become adults, the foundation is already laid. You have already laid and put everything in them that needs to be in there. And when you have done that, the decisions they make is not a reflection on you because you've taught them right from wrong. So if they make a decision and it caused them to fail, and, and even if they're tormented by it, you just remind them that it's a life lesson. What is the lesson that you got out of this decision that you made? If they can tell you what the lesson is, then that's, that's not a mistake. That's a life lesson. And so we learn from making decisions that work or don't work. Life is all about trial and error. There is no book on how to live this life perfectly. And the last perfect person was nailed to the cross. So we're going to have flaws. We're going to have shortcomings. But as we progress through this life, we learn what works, what don't work, how to do it, how to do it better. That's what life is all about. And it's not about judging ourselves or being judged. So when we know that we love them unconditionally and we know that they're they're navigating their way through and it's rough. You know, when you think about a trailblazer, a trailblazer goes into virgin woods with an ax and cut a path for everybody else to come behind them. And that's what each of our children has to do. They have to go out into this world sometimes this wicked world and they have to take the tools that we've given them and they have to cut their way through a path they have to cut a path to get through That's they have to. That's so the next one is keep them covered keep them covered in prayer always that is the true ministry of motherhood because we can't force them we can't make them when you override their will you're going off into a whole nother spirit we model for them, we teach them, we give them wisdom, but the ultimate decision becomes theirs. They're not robots. It'd be so nice if I could just push the little buttons and she'd do everything perfectly. Uh, 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 uh. And, and you know what, I'm going to stop right there because, you know, I know I went through this even myself in one of the books I wrote, I talked about, you know, letting go and letting my son choose his own path. And, and it is so true because, you know, even as a mother, and I like how you said the ministry of motherhood, mm -hmm. that is powerful, right? Because a lot of times, like, we have to allow them to be, and we don't know. And, you know, it's like, God, what do I do? Mm -hmm. You know, and who is this child, mm -hmm. right? And so a lot of times we have to let go of our own ideas, mm -hmm. right? Our own wishes for them, you know, what we think about, and let them, you know, like, I love that you said, trail their own path, you know, mm -hmm. and become the trailblazer that they are for themselves that is so powerful and that's a part of that ministry motherhood mm -hmm. is a ministry I, I love that so just before i know you got one more to go but i want to make sure everybody that's watching you know she's given us seven amazing tips on regards to motherhood so if you're watching please type them in if you're, you're taking notes um and the last one that she said was number seven was to keep them in prayer that is so so powerful in the ministry of, of so i just want to give just jump that in there but go ahead you go so, <laughs> you go ahead and take us home <laughs> but, uh, i want to go back and touch on the self-care because it was brought up okay and so yeah. self-care sometimes especially, especially in the christian community we are made to feel guilty if we uh pursue any kind of self-care because we're supposed to sacrifice ourselves for for others and but if we don't take care of ourselves, we will crash and burn and may lose the passion for motherhood altogether. So it's critical. How can I love others as I love myself? How can I show the love to others or the love of Christ to others if I haven't fully begun to take care of myself? When we get out of balance, a lot of times we flip over. And when we flip over, we may go into addictions. And those addictions could be anything and especially if we're in the menopause age, because menopause brings in a whole nother level of issues for women. So we may get into addictions. A lot of times menopausal women will actually become closet drinkers. 
because they have insomnia at night. And so they begin to sip a little wine and then it may turn into a little something stronger. And then it may turn into some Patron and some Citron and some Motrons because that's the one thing that helps them sleep at night. When we become out of balance, then we may become addicted to other people. We may fall into uh, sexual relationships we really don't want to be in. We may fall into gambling. We look for an outlet. We look for a place to breathe. We look for retail shopping, you know, my shopping therapy. You know, we may get into the ice cream, having how many gallons of ice cream in the refrigerator. So we go into, we're going to let this thing out some way, one way or another. So that's why we have to keep it balanced. So when we do self-care, it can be different for everyone. Just like Pastor Stewart said, hers is just showering and sleep. You know, for, for some people, and they may not know what to do, um, but like Kinsley, find, find an hour that you can find a book that you want. Go to the bookstore, Barnes and Nobles, and just give yourself an hour. Pick out a book, sit down somewhere comfortable, and just read a passage and see if this is a book you like to have. Take a mental break. See, we, we do vacations, but it's okay to take a mental vacation. A one hour mental vacation in the middle of the day will do your soul good. Vacation means vacate, get away from your normal routine. When you go on vacation, you don't go to work every day. You don't do the things you normally would do on your regular given day. So take the mental vacation and abandon your regular schedule and find something, even if it's meditating for an hour. Even, even if it's sitting out on the back porch, just looking at the trees and listening to the birds. I like water. I can sit by water for an hour and just look at it and just watch the waves and, and feel the wind. I just I love water. It gives me peace. So whatever you find, if you can't find anything, Google self-care and see what kind of things come up. Because you may not do the nails, you may not do the hair. Maybe you can't go like with COVID. Boy, my hair and nails went through some traumatic times. <laughs> but what I did find is that I could get in my car and I can, especially on sunny days, I would take my youngest daughter, Karina. We would get in the car and we may drive anywhere from, from 10 miles to 60 miles from my house, just letting the sun come in and giving us the vitamin D that we need. And it was refreshing, totally refreshing and safe. You know, so we do what we need to do to get that balance. Find your place in your way of doing self-care. Because again, if you go down, the whole household is going down like a one egg pudding. <laughs> and if you know anything about pudding, you got to have some eggs. <laughs> oh man, that this is so, so good. I mean, you've given us so many. What was number eight? Was self-care number eight? Self-care is number eight. Self-care mm -hmm. was number eight. That mental vacation, because like you said, a lot of times, you know, you can't really go everywhere. You might not even have the finances to go anywhere. But exactly. listen, you can go sit in front of a lake. You can go sit underneath a tree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's various things, but you, you can definitely, you definitely need to do it. So this was just so, so good. I don't know about you all, but I know I have been really blessed, enriched, um, and and these are all really practical, practical things that we can do as we continue on our ministry of motherhood. Ministry. I love that, Dr. K. I love that one. Ministry of motherhood and really seeing it and looking at it just that way. And because it doesn't stop, you know, you think once they get 18, 22, 25, what, what's the age? I don't know. Right. But it never really ends. Right. But you still with them, you know, I'm just now for me now, you know, my son got married. Now I got a daughter in law. Lord knows what am I going to do with a daughter in law? This is going to be really interesting. Y'all pray for me. You're going right? to love on her and you're going to have a whole new experience because now you got the girl experience. Okay. But, but it is ministry. And how do we continue, mm -hmm. you know, developing and pouring into our children? children at all the different stages of life um, is certainly let me, add, let me add one thing um, this is one piece of wisdom that, that changed my life and it was never maybe too late for some people but it was it's never raise your voice at your children I've been married 24 years I've raised my voice to my husband twice and both times was an emergency because when you raise your voice at your children and you stay up at a pitch like this, they become so accustomed to that voice that when there's an emergency, 
they can't distinguish between the two. Wow. And my hairdresser shared this with me. His one customer never raised her voice. Her eight-year-old son was going between cars to go across the street to catch his bus. And a bus was coming and he didn't see the bus. His mother could see the bus, but he couldn't. And she screamed out his name. And because he had never heard her scream, he stopped in his tracks and it saved his life. So make it a habit of staying at the sweetest, softest voice you could possibly muster. Even when you're angry, even when I'm angry, I'll talk like this. Because if you want to capture someone's attention, you whisper. They listen. That's, that's, that's powerful. You're, you're so powerful. Boy, I wish I would have known you a long time ago. So I go. <laughs> I'm still working out. I'm still in ministry. And, uh, I, we still, all are. It, it, it never, never really stops. So right. I, I just, you know what? The, the responses have been amazing. Tracy said that this has been such a valuable, uh, you know, time. And I thank you. We went extra, but we had a lot um, to share. And, and tonight to kick off, um, you know, mental health awareness in our community was so, so key. Um, and I wanted to have these women, these mothers share a bit about their experience um so and, and for you to come and put the icing on the cake and give us the real tangible solutions that's, that's really the really key so i bless you i thank you so much for being here for your yes um for your obedience i love your voice oh, your tone you. um you know you really really lead by example and, and you're helping us and i know you're helping and blessing others out there so again everybody that's watching please like and more importantly share because I, I know as my mentor says listen it may even if it's just not for you it may be it may be someone else's breakthrough there mm -hmm. could be a mother watching that is at her wits end tonight <laughs> and, and even one thing you even talked about domestic violence from the beginning that was the report about mm -hmm. domestic violence and abuse that goes on and that increases right because of being shut down and locked in um mm -hmm. so we even pray for those that are even experiencing that tonight night um you know to, to to find your your peace find your space and, and get to going get to moving you know <laughs> there you go. um you know contact us of course um so dr kathy i know you're in flint michigan but um is there any way if people want to reach out to you and connect with you um do you do virtual sessions as well or is I it just, okay I let them know how they can can reach out to you um you can reach out to me i'm on facebook that's the easiest way Facebook and Facebook Messenger. My okay. telephone number is 810-845-0200, 810-845-0200. I've been trained to say it on radio three times, 810-845-0200. And you can text me um, if I'm with the, in a session, I won't be able to answer immediately, but I will respond. Text is best. And, and I can set up a time to talk to you, but I am, I feel like, and I know God put me on this earth to empower people and to reverse the curse of dysfunctional relationships. Reverse the, the curse, curse of dysfunctional of relationships? Time for us to be healthy, emotionally healthy. With that, <laughs> I thank you. I, I pray for you. Um, I don't know if any of our guests want to come back on and give their, their thanks um, in regards to uh, Dr. Kathy Barton Brown. Reverend Stewart, you still there? Did you want to say anything? Okay, there you go. Go ahead. Okay. Doctor, thank you so much for your words of wisdom and encouragement. And I wrote down some notes and some things I was too excited to write down. But I know that um, Dr. Anana will uh, share those her notes with me. But it really, um, when you, the last thing you said was reverse the curse of dysfunctional relationships. And sometimes until we step out of what was comfortable, we don't even know it's dysfunctional. That's right. You know, we have normalized dysfunction. Yes. And that which is normal because I've, you know, you know, an illustration was where a child who was being abused when they went to court, family court was like, well, where do you want to go? The child said back home because mm -hmm. that's all that they know. Even mm -hmm. though it was bad, they had no idea that it was bad because it's all they knew. And that's sometimes right. we don't know that there's something better than or other than what we've been in, whatever it is. 
I took a child shopping who had been removed from her mother and had a cart full of brand new clothes that she picked out. She ran under the rack screaming, you don't love me? You don't love me? The first day she got in trouble and had to be disciplined, she screamed out, I love you, mama. Her concept of love was completely twisted. Yes. Pain was right. love. Blessing was something that she didn't understand. Right. Thank Powerful. you for that. Thank Powerful. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, let's see, Man Mano is still here. Mano, did you want to share before we, before we, uh, maybe not. I don't know if I can get her back on. Thank you for the opportunity. This has been fun. Yes, right. Go ahead, Mano. Hi, thank you. Oh, I've learned so much from you, doctor. I'm like, I'm overwhelmed. Um, yes, uh, self care. I definitely, it's. I definitely need to uh, to start thinking of me. I just love the way you spoke um, about when we speak to our children to speak on the on the lower voice. <laughs> I, I do. For some reason, I must have known that and wanted to 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 carry through with that. But sometimes you just, you know. Um, yeah. As, and uh, no, I just, you're amazing. I'm for sure going to follow you. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. But, you know, in our frustration, and if we've seen our parents raise their voice, then that's, all, that's what we do. We do what's been modeled before us. And it's not, it takes one idea and one person putting that idea in action, break the curse that's been done for generations. And so we get the information and then we take the action. And it, it takes a while to get in the habit because that's what we're used to. But once we break that habit and begin to see the results, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Good stuff. Good stuff. So thank you so much, Mano, for sharing your story. And I think last but not least, I believe Wendy is back. We'll have her come on. <laughs> Everybody got their, their therapy tonight. <laughs> hey, Wendy. I, I don't know if Wendy, she's may, might not have a, the best signal. Wendy, I don't think we can hear you, sis. No, okay. Well, I know she typed in. Can you hear us? You there? Yeah, no. So I know she typed in. She said, thank you for all your gems and that all you've shared. Um, and she is one of our younger moms, of course, <laughs> with those babies. Um, so I know that we were really able to um, to share and help her um, along this ministry of motherhood. Um, so I know it'll be a blessing to her um, as well. All right, Wendy. No, I don't think we were able to connect with you. It's like breaking up a bit. But um, again, to everyone who are watching, who joined us tonight, Dr. Kathy Barton Brown, I, I so appreciate you and love oh, you. I um, love you. Bro, Thank you for the opportunity. Heart. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, <laughs> you all, again, if you can connect with her. She does do virtual sessions, but if if not, wherever you at, you know what? There is help. There is options. And I want you all, as a mother, dealing with all the, the heaviness, as we can say, that's going on, the things, the dysfunction that may even be happening, that we need to reach out, get help, get the support that you need and that you deserve because your family needs you. We need you at optimal level. Um, and we want you to continue on to be all that you are, that God has called you to be. Even in this season, even during the crisis, you can continue to shine bright. Uh, because listen, we're rooting for your rise. Y'all know that. Listen, Dr. A is rooting for your rise. So I thank you all. Thank you everyone for watching. Um, and again, reach out, connect. You can also go to my website, inbox me if there's anything that I can help you with. That is exactly what we're here to do. So great session tonight, longer than we've ever done. Uh, we'll be able to rebroadcast and do a lot of amazing things with it. But I thank you. I will let you go, Dr. Kathy Barton Brown. To all of the amazing women and mothers out there, listen, continue to be bold, be blessed, girl. Be bold, be you, and be blessed. Dr. A signing out. Have a great night.